Welcome back everyone to the Monash Warwick Zurich Texas Data Workshop. To conclude this session, this fourth workshop, we now have trying something a bit new, a panel discussion where on Texas data methods, where we'll, we will have Simon Angus from Monash, Stephen Hansen from Imperial now UCL and Ariana Ornagi from Heritage School to present on this broad issue of, of Texas data methods in social science and related fields. So as I've already uh, in, informed them, we're gonna start with some quick just intro uh, presentations, you know, three, four or five minutes or so. And I'll have a few follow-up questions. We want to encourage uh, discussion uh, among the panelists and between the panelists. And then we'll open it up to the audience for, for questions and further comments. So to start things off, I wanna give each panelist a chance to make a comment about what is the big success in Texas data for social science? And what is a big open problem or challenge? And uh, you are free to interpret that uh, in, 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 a, in different directions as you go. And I'd like to start with Ariana. Okay, great. So thanks for having me and thanks Elliot and, and Pasha for organizing this workshop. Uh, it was really super interesting presentations and uh, organized flawlessly. Uh, so let me start uh, just by saying that uh, in general, I think if I think of the one success, uh, it may be, you know, <laughs> maybe quite obvious, but it's really, I think, um, really the fact that Texas data has opened up the possibility of studying really new and exciting questions, uh, but also like get back to old questions that we are really interested in in economics, uh, but uh, didn't have kind of the opportunity to address uh, as we are doing now uh, because of uh, because of constraint with data and, uh, you know, and, and, and measurement really. Um, and so, you know, even from this workshop, we have uh, a really exciting examples. I think the progress that has been done on narrative uh, is one of the most exciting things, uh, at least personally for me, because uh, it really helps us to get, uh, a, you know, cultural questions, but also very much policy questions with the example of climate change. And also more generally, I think, uh, recently, I mean, I'm especially interested in media, uh, as was probably clear from from the from the paper that we presented. But uh, this idea of also, uh, you know, very recently there have been um, very many papers looking at media bias uh, in different ways, uh, and so the opportunity of doing that uh, that's great. Now, if I think of the problems or I think of the challenges uh, that very much relate to this. Um, I think um, kind of what I see as the big challenge right now is the fact that, you know, as we are kind of, as more and more people are using these uh, methods for to answer like a wide variety of questions, we are really seeing kind of uh, many applications that are really kind of a, a wealth of applications that tend to be very context specific. And when you, when we approach that, um, as uh, especially I'm thinking of people who are really trained as economists who have an interest in kind of these NLP methodologies but are not trained, uh, who don't have a background in computer science or NLP specifically, uh, then we are really, um, it's very like it, it, it's a big challenge to try and figure out how to implement these methods uh, correctly. And I'm thinking this more like both from a conceptual perspective and from an implementation perspective. Um, from the conceptual perspective, uh, it's really like it, it's not always clear how to operationalize this complex con concept that we're interested in studying and doing it uh, with the correct methodology um, and also um, exactly like oper operationalizing them correctly in a way that both is helpful for the researchers but also doesn't doesn't perhaps uh, introduce some uh, constraints or some some uh, problems in the in the data or in the way that we are asking asking the question. And on the other hand, I think especially for practitioners, also the practical side uh, of these very domain specific applications can be challenging. Sometimes uh, it's um, it, it, it's not that straightforward to figure out what are the kind of parameters that really matter, what is robust and what is not. Uh, and I think especially uh, perhaps because of how publication works in economics, um, you know, we have all this great work that goes in the methods that then gets a little bit lost. And, you know, sometimes we have like these incredibly big uh, you know, appendices when you're really explaining all the things that we have tried and we have not tried, uh, but sometimes that, that, gets, that gets a little bit lost. And so I, I think kind of something that would be, that would be great is if we could 
in general, like if, if that was given, um, it, you know, maybe not a little bit more value, but also uh, really finding guidance on these sorts of things. And I think also being transparent on what works, what doesn't work with these methods, there's uh, for sure like 10, 10 million of us checks even more uh, than, than the than standard economics that you could try. And of course, something is going to fail, uh, but then kind of having this idea of, um, of that is, um, I think that could be that could be helpful, but really trying to uh, maybe make this uh, in a more uh, standard framework or like standard approaches that people could uh, could follow, I think would be um, you know that would be helpful for especially for uh, external practitioners uh, that are interested in uh, in these methods. And on on a small thing, sometimes that is also challenging is like understanding what is really needed, what is overkill. Uh, and kind of find the balance for that, especially if you're not really interested in developing a new method, but just applying it to answer a question. So that's also something that uh, is generally a challenge that I find in my, <laughs> in <laughs> when I want to use methodologies. Uh, and then it's like, oh, is it better to do a simple thing that I can convince people very easily versus methodologies that uh, sometimes with, you know, with economics referees take a lot, you know, a lot of discussions to really try to convince them that what you're doing makes. Um, makes sense. Great. Thank you, Ariana. So now I'll turn it to Simon. Could you tell us about a success and a challenge in text of data? Thanks, Elliot. Um, and I mean, Ariana's, I think, <laughs> said a lot of, uh, you know, what I was thinking as well. Um, I, I have a somewhat a short list of successes, and then I have a long, like, um, list of challenges or things that may be rallying calls. Um, on the successes, I think there's a growing acceptance of NLP methods uh, in econ applied work, which is fantastic. And I think you see a maturing of that from original uh, kind of, whether that's keyword or term matching, which seems like reviewers are like, I get it, I can understand that, I can see the word, and they're very convinced about that. And then it's like, oh, we did a topic model, and they're like, well, you need to tell me some more. And now they're having to deal with problems where they say, oh, we then used an API and we used a you know, 82 million parameter model and uh, you don't need to worry too much about that, but it's state of the art. And then, we, and then you're like, hang on, I've, you've lost me. Um, so on the one hand, like we're getting, there's more papers which are showing, and even, I mean, I think word embeddings, for example, are getting a reasonable acceptance. People are like, okay, I, you slow down, you explain that we're going to, train on some large amount of text, we're going to use words. You can think of this as like the machine is learning what a word means and we're going to build some sort of dimension and you're happy with dimensions and then we're going to do some measurements that you know what we, you know, geometry, yep, I'm with you still. So that's all fine. And so I think like we should celebrate the wins. At the same time, I think we've got quite a lot of work to do. I would say that um, like I've been part of other, like I'm kind of a computational scientist, I guess, like I'm you know, agent-based modeling through to data science and whatever, and other communities, you've got to build legitimacy and trust in the methods. And I think that's where we're kind of at. So whilst celebrating the wins, I think we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And this sort of workshop is like super fantastic. Uh, I think we, you know, more and more of doing this sort of thing, uh, sharing our methods, challenging each other. How do you know this? Why that? Have you validated it? And it's going to be a period of slow science in a sense of, and I, I think some of the challenges for that is actually finding outlets and ways to, in our profession, in economics, what will be the journal that will take validation studies of text as data, applied papers, replication studies, and so on? Who will be the editors who will be willing to see that? Um, what kind of uh, Git repositories and standard data sets are we going to start building that have an econ focus or an econ text focus? I mean, the papers that we've been presenting from our team, we're using like, you know, Rotten Tomatoes data set because... Like that's the, we're trying to convince an ML audience and hopefully we can get a, a core ML conference to accept our paper, which is actually quite a high bar if you want to go to a good one. So you need to use all their big data sets and you're competing with like, well, Google. Um, and so, the, you know, the compute needs. So it's like I've got to play in a very heavy, you know, technical side to get this technical thing across to try and then use this method to convince my econ colleagues. Do they trust the ML conference paper? I'm not sure. Do they want to see that in an applied, you know, econ paper because they know the editor and they trust? Like, so I think we've got a bit of work to do trying to find how to build that sort of legitimacy. And it probably has to look more econ when we come to do evaluation and so on. And that's going to be slow science work. So we're going to have to help each other to build, you know, places where we've got standard data sets, standard understanding, and we test our models and rigorously show that this is the way that we should do it. 
Um, so that's, I think, a challenge. Uh, another challenge is going to be actually the pipe. We talk a lot about pipeline. There's a pipeline of human capital. So uh, if you caught Paul explaining what we're trying to do here at Soda in terms of uh, we, we've got fantastic you know, wonderful people who have often got a computer science background who are interested in applications to social science. Uh, and it takes a long time to work and train and get the culture and, you know, what the problems we work on. And we want to hold on to them and we want to kind of build culture and unity around that. That's a, that's a privilege and been fantastic at SOTA, but, you know, not everyone can do that. If we look at our standard econ or undergrad programs, it's quite hard to convince, you know, your head of, uh, education or whomever it is that you know we need more computer science or algorithmic thinking or you know like you know at best we'll get someone you know with some r or some stator application but you know oh actually we'd like them to do ml or python or on work on cloud or computers as servants like where does that fit um so we've got some work to do there as well in terms of convincing the pipeline of human capital to bring these together at the moment we're basically fusing econ training and applied work with uh, ML computer science training and trying to bring, you know, people interested in both sides together into, you know, certain bespoke labs. So it's not a mainstream thing, I think. And I don't think we'll ever be mainstream, but there's a there's a lot of work in in that in that area. Um, I've got some other like moving to like from my <laughs> this is the, talking to ourselves about our field. I've got some grand challenges, but maybe I'll get to that um, later. I'll stop for now. Very good. We'll come back to that. Stephen, do you want to tell us about a success and a challenge? Yeah, I think so. Um, and also, you you um, started the panel by thanking the presenters. I want to thank you and Sasha because um, there aren't very many forums where um, you know these these diverse papers are brought together. And I've, I've sort of followed the progress of this conference over the last you know few years while it's happened, and um, you can see the quality getting getting better every year. And um, I think you guys are doing a, a a great service here. So so thank you. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep it short because it seems like there's a little bit of um, you know agreement between what we all think. So in terms of the successes, I guess what I like to think of as 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 the main success is that we all know that economics. I, well, I don't know if we all know, but my my understanding is that economics has become a much more kind of empirical profession. If you pick up the AER in the 1970s, like 75 percent of the papers were pure theory. And now today, if you pick up the AER, probably more than 75% are empirical, maybe with a model, but with an empirical component. And I think part of that is because, you know, to test models requires data. And in the 1970s, there was probably data limitations. And I guess the first wave of data um, that let us move economics forward as an empirical profession were administrative data sets or micro data sets where we could start measuring, you know, all kinds of things like education interventions or health outcomes or, you know, local income indices or whatever. But at the same time, I think that there's a lot of economic theory about phenomena that will never have kind of numeric administrative data. So when you think about the Texas data papers that have made a big impact, I would argue that they've made a big impact because they've sought to measure things that are important for evaluating theory models. Like let's take the EPU index of Baker, Bloom and Davis. Now, the reason that I think that that made a big impact is because for 20 or 30 years, there was a theory literature on uncertainty and investment, right? This goes back to, I think, Dixit's work in the 1980s and 1990s. Then Nick Bloom and um, others started putting this idea into equilibrium models that uncertainty would you know, affect uh, uh, investment dynamics. But we had no way of measuring uncertainty, right? Until these people came along and proposed this, this measure. And, and, and now we can, right? And now we can start evaluating the quantitative significance of, uh, of uh, uncertainty shocks in the macroeconomy. The Ginskow Shapiro paper in 2010, um, which I think is the other like 1,000 citation text this data in economics. Again, I think it's made a big impact because you started with a theory. Right, we want to understand what drives media slant, and the problem is we have no numeric data for doing that, and so we're going to go take unstructured data and 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 measure that. So for me, I mean, uh, Ariana basically said the same thing that the success has been measurement, but if I could qualify that just by saying it's not just you know measurement for its own sake, it's measurement because there are certain gaps in the empirical base that we need to advance our understanding of theoretical mechanisms of the profession. And so I think I think that's kind of where the sweet spot is, and um, a lot of papers don't don't quite meet it, right? They propose some index 
kind of in the absence of any theoretical context, and it's a bit unclear what one is supposed to do with it. Um, but for me, the great success is this when you is when you weld these two things together. All right. So in terms of challenges, I don't know if I'm allowed to be too self-referential, Elliot, but uh, we've had a good time over the last four or five months writing uh, an annual review of economics draft paper, which should be published next year. And there's been a lot of like you know Texas data review, so it, it was a little bit difficult to carve out space to say something new. Um, and I know some of you on this phone call provided feedback, and we we appreciate that. But I think one of the one of the new things we're trying to say, and again, this draws on the other two panelists, is that like I don't know if this is too cynical or you know too too pessimistic, but I would basically say in economics there is no standard way of evaluating how algorithms are appropriate or not appropriate for a given task and how they're performing in a given task. So one exercise that Elliot and I did was something I, I think is very standard, which is compare document similarity. Right, so there's, there's, there's many papers that use some notion of textual similarity to proxy some economic fundamental, like the Hoberg and Phillips work uses similarity between two K, uh, 10K filings to proxy distance in a hoteling lot. There's this um, Kelly et al. paper that uses the distance between patent text to proxy uh, technological innovation. Well, the problem is as a referee, when I pick up a paper that uses document similarity to measure something, I often have no idea why the particular algorithm was chosen that the author chose. Some people use back of words cosine similarity. Some people use average word embeddings cosine similarity. Some people use topic models. Some people use non-negative matrix factorization. Why? I have no idea. The author just kind of says, we use algorithm A. Okay, so the question is, one, does that choice matter? So one exercise we do is we take like 12 different ways of doing this and show that it does matter on a standardized task of measuring document similarity in the context of corporate filings. Question two, do those differences in document similarities affect downstream regression inference? Finding two of this little exercise we did is yet, yes, it does. So if you wanna do like basic inference on regression coefficients of just firm size affect, you know, similarity in 10K filings, depending on the method you use, you're gonna get a different answer. That's a problem. Another problem is I don't even know what it would mean to say one method is working and another method is not working, right? And these like unsupervised learning problems, okay, I, I, I see different algorithms produce different answers, but what would it mean for one algorithm to work? Well, presumably I would need some validation task to benchmark against. And currently there is no validation task to benchmark against. Now, some authors, Elliot and others, kind of do validation within application, so I, you know, I spend a long time hiring RAs to look at my particular results and validate them. The problem is that's again, like very paper specific. I think one of the reasons the computer science literature makes progress is because they have like paper non-specific tasks. So different papers can all use the common kind of standardized tasks to benchmark against and Simon um, uh, mentioned this. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, that's a big challenge understanding why different algorithms have the properties they do and even defining what it means to work and trying to come up as a profession with some language to start making discipline choices about some of these things. Because at the moment, it's a, it's a little bit of a mess. I mean, as a, as a referee who gets papers coming across on different things, it's kind of the wild west um, out there. And this is in stark contrast to like traditional applied micro where I'm like, we spent very little time on the measurement, and then I'm looking at 40 pages of appendix tables on the downstream regression models. So there's a little bit of an imbalance on where we're focusing effort in this in this empirical work. Thank you, Stephen. So now I have a a, num a, a, a small handful of follow-up questions that I'll thank Sasha Becker for providing, but I hope it's okay that I ask them on, on your behalf. It, um, so starting, going back to Simon, I think this will be a, a, ch a chance for you to, to revisit some of the, the bigger ideas that, that you mentioned previously. Are different text corpora more heterogeneous than numerical data? And is that one of the reasons that it's harder to find a standardized approach or code for purely applied people? And is this, does this make text as data more niche or more elite? We don't have an answer to that question, right? Um, 
so there's just a lot of complex ways to pitch that. So there's um, there's within a topic or a class of documents. There's time. There's language. There's authorship. Right. So all of these things can change the even the even the vocabulary. So from a combinatorial perspective, even just the number of ways we can arrange the darn words or have variations on, you know, rain or snow or uncertainty or confidence, these are all things. Um, and we have, you know, in machine learning, we have the problem of concept drift, drift. We don't really have that in quantitative data. I mean, we have the problem of inflation. And so we have to correct, you know, our over time. But economics has known about that for a long time. And we've got fairly established methods for saying what someone earned in 1910 versus now. But what's the concept of, of class in 1860 versus today? Well, it's drifted. So what, what am I talking about between those two? Um, so yeah, I think it's it's hard. And I think I think you I think you could build the argument, as I probably am at the moment, that there is more heterogeneity. But to you know, Stephen's point, I think. Um, it means we're going to have to do a lot of proving to ourselves and others that we've got, you know, we've got, we got, we're when we when we're doing things like the we've got a straight ruler. We we kind of know what we're doing. Like we we can say that this is with confidence. Now, I come more from a physical sciences background um, into economics, and so I think of you know, well, can I do some sort of strong uh, test to say that my instrument works? And so that's, I mean, you'll see us like I've we do a lot of synthetic evaluation so we will inject exact we get control over what we're trying to measure we're not even using human evaluation we're like locking it down to say this is exactly what i put into my corpus can i even recover that because like if i can't do that then i'm really struggling and that of course how generalizable that's going to be but what we could do as a service to the community and what i would probably encourage us to think about doing is make these synthetic uh data generating processes available more widely. I don't know if we're going to end up with the kind of like standard data sets in core ML, but we might start to populate some of this, whether it's across time, across language and so on with economic focus. And then we can start actually building some confidence in these sort of methods and answer the questions because I, I totally agree. Like I would be the same as a, you know, you read a paper and you become very skeptical of your own things and you think, how do I know? So you just rush to doing some sort of placebo or synthetic or null model to say, well, you know, what does the null model say? And sometimes alarmingly, you know, you, you, you don't have that much different results. So you, I think we, we need to be super, uh, a big dose of um, defending of the null, as uh, Sasha would say, uh, in, in what we do here and being really careful about that. Um, but I think, so I, my general answer to the question posed is, is a yes. And uh, for, for reasons that language is many splendid and beautiful, uh, but that means we're going to have to work quite hard to get our arms around that variation and uh, feel confident that we're measuring something. Thank you, Simon. I now have a follow-up for Ariana, and that's uh, this is also on behalf of Sasha, so thank you, Sasha. On the issue of uh, data mining and just kind of research approach, and, and uh, Sasha compares our, our problems in Texas data to his uh, past work on matching methods, and that there's this concern that there's many degrees of freedom in choosing what algorithm. So in their case, it was matching algorithms. In our case, it's different types of data algorithms. And you know, are, are there some first ways we can, we, some first approaches that we can take to make the readers and the referees, uh, you know, un understand what our thought process and, and to, ha to have have some reassurance. You know, I, I know we won't get close to OLS, but you know, how, how do we close the gap? Yeah, no, thanks for the thanks for the question. Absolutely. Uh, I think that the issue of like many degrees of freedom is uh, sometimes a little bit like underplayed, I guess, in the Texas data application, but it's like super important. So even uh, today we have seen um, in the last few, two days, we've seen a lot of applications in which we're trying to identify a concept and we take a list of words and even the choice of the list of words is like 
already, you know, which is kind of the basic starting point can be potentially influential in what uh, one measures and what results one found. And uh, so how, how do you even start from that? And let alone then, you know, deciding as, you, as, uh, as Steven was saying, you know, if you do uh, document similarity, which is like a very uh, common application of Texas data and you have like so many options and they give you different, different answers. So that's very, um, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's definitely a, a, a big issue because you can, uh, really go down the road of, um, you know, just like, you know, it, it clearly like a it, big problem with just like picking anything that works, uh, which uh, is of course something that we do not want to have. Um, and so definitely uh, I think being very transparent uh, from the point of view of, of the researcher who's working on a project is, is great. Trying to tie uh, one's hands uh, as much as possible uh, is also, um, I think, is also something that could be uh, that could be done. And here I'm thinking a lot of the of a parallel with what people are doing with RCTs, where you have these, uh, you know, we, we have a different flavor of, of these issues in which you can run like very long surveys in which you ask like 10, 10 million questions and you can, um, you know, you, you have to find a way of disciplining uh, one's cells. And so on the one hand, I think being very explicit uh, for the researchers, very, very kind of uh, finding like principal solutions and very, being very clear on what principle was was found and kind of what are the limitations of what followed and what are the limitations of that. Uh, that is a is a I, I think would be a great starting point. And then um, as the other two panelists was also saying, kind of thinking about uh, general ways of validating methods and uh, how different methods would apply to different contexts and finding a way of doing it kind of more generally than how we're doing now would probably also be, um, I think, something that uh, we should definitely uh, encourage more and do more. Thank you, Ariana. Now I'd like to invite Sasha to ask a question. Yeah, so another one on my list was about reproducibility. Um, I guess, especially when you use commercial products that are online, um, do we have version control? Or is the fact that they constantly update their algorithms in the background uh, a problem that even if I rerun my own algorithm the day later, um, the algorithm has changed because the kind of crown truth data in the background has been enlarged, updated. And is that a general ethical problem for the uh, publication process? And the second one quite related is um, to the extent that we also use text as data as a step zero, uh, in running regressions, does anyone yet ever uh, consider the problem of generated regressors where the standard errors need to be adjusted for whatever you've done before you run that regression? Whoever wants to answer that, whose turn is it? Uh, Stephen. Uh -huh. Hi. No, I, I think the first problem you mentioned is, is, is interesting because there I think in working with text, there's kind of two things going on at the same time. The first is it's unstructured data, right? Which generates high dimensional feature spaces and sequence information is important and we need to handle that algorithmically. I think another issue that's sort of conceptually distinct, but often also going on is that it's naturally occurring, right? Not, it's not collected administratively. It's just kind of generated by digital platforms. But the same is also true of like, some kinds of structured data, like financial transactions, it's the same, right? Banks might update how they design their credit card systems or whatever. Um, but I think it's a great point. So I'm, if, if I can be honest about the work with Peter, one of the delays that we have is that we wanted to extend this like remote work measure just by a couple of months, you know, to get the get summer of 22 in the paper before it came out as a working paper. Well, then we plotted these like aggregate time series and suddenly, like the New Zealand remote work share, like tripled in July. And we're like, oh, okay, I guess we're not going to like just, you know, this wasn't just run algorithm again and publish paper. And then you dig into it, and it turns out indeed there's like a new job board that started to be screened uh, in that particular month that has some weird structure, which means there's a link on it to other jobs that it offers, all of which are remote or, you know, something. So, like all of these little things going on in the background is something else that I'm not sure researchers are, all, are often totally transparent about. How many burning glass papers are there? I mean, you know, dozens and dozens of burning glass papers, at least in the US. Once you start scratching behind the surface a little bit, one starts to wonder, 
like choices have to be made when you use this data. That's inevitable. Those choices are often not in the appendix of the paper. And I'm not sure this degree of freedom problem that we've been talking about here also applies to those filtering choices and also needs some discipline standardization and validation. And often it's not discussed. On the, on the, on the second question, I think if you work with generative models, uncertainty quantification is quite straightforward, right? So if you can build a likelihood function that links the upstream measurement with the downstream regression, um, you can sort of jointly estimate the system to do uncertainty quantification. Um, I think when you're using like non-statistical measures, how to, you know, come up with the language of the uncertainty in those, like a non-parametric non, non measurement exercise in a, in a regression downstream, um, maybe a little less straightforward. But yeah, you're right, Sasha. Essentially, measurement and regression are treated as separate problems in the literature. Um, and I think in the last couple of years, people start to start to ask this question. Kai Gehring, you had a couple of interesting questions in the chat. Do you want to bring one or two of those up for the panelists? Love to, but, but first, uh, let me renew the thanks to Sasha and you. I, I think th this is absolutely great. And, and I love a session like this because we do this way too little in economics. I mean, but, but I think it, it's crucial. I mean, just thinking of history, I think when, like, I think Hayek and, other, and Friedman and others had a couple of conferences that just focus on how do we define economic freedom. And I think we do this way too little in economics, then we have these mill or miss or ill identified concepts. So I think this is great. Uh, to my question, I don't want to just ramble. So I think the theory part to me, that was great. I think we need to think what are the concepts that are grounded in economic or other theory and how can we link them then to text-based measures? Like when we take the analogy with spatial data, and my perception of spatial data really took off with the Henderson et al. paper, because that essentially said you can take nighttime light from satellites as a proxy for GDP. And then, of course, a lot of researchers said, yeah, that's great, because there are many settings where I didn't have proper GDP data, and GDP data has its downsides. Uh, Paul and Roland's paper then, and others followed up in that footstep. So I think a question to the panelists is, what do you think the concepts are where text has particular advantages? And one of my own ideas is related to my research, but also Ajay Moglu highlighted this recently, is that what's missing is we, we have a lot of this individual behavioral psychology in economics now, but now we realize the social psychology, the group psychology aspects also matter. And that whether you think in this area, text might have some advantages. Let me have a go. Uh, I'd say two things. Um, one is um, the uh, time scale of human text generation is typically, unlike satellite data, at least if you don't own your own satellites, vastly faster, like smaller time scale than most economic variables. So that gives you a, if you can get some phenomena you're interested in, which has interesting time scales evolving because most economists don't deal in days or weeks. Why? It's not because there's not interesting things happening. It's because we don't have data on days or weeks mostly. And so we're focused on things over years or months. Okay. Now, if you've got some relatively fast moving chain of events, and particularly you're interested in whether it's say protest evolution or so on, looking at three monthly or quarterly data on some stressor in the environment, it's not going to help you. It's too slow. I mean, it, it just becomes a fixed effect in some regression. What you need to see is what's happening at a time scale of that the events are starting to occur. So text opens that up for you and you can start to test theories of how people coordinate, communicate and mobilize, for example, um, in a way that I think you don't usually get access to. And text provides you not only just simply an intensity variable, so how much are they talking about this thing, but you can start actually get, well, what are they saying? And is it linked to some theory of association? I guess bringing in other psychological theories and so on. So I think that's, that's there's, some, there's something on the table there about us for using text as a more high frequency uh, moving data set. Um, the second uh, uh, part, I think, of where uh, text is potentially you know, going to be important and changing um, is the way that it encodes uh, things that we previously, I guess, only saw through proxy uh, variables. 
And so we've done lots of surveys before, or people will use surveys about confidence or something in, you know, that's going on in the world, or we might find out about what's happened uh, through decisions that are made by certain groups that we don't necessarily, like their decisions become economic data. Now we can actually analyze the decision-making process, or we can analyze the, uh, the kind of material that is going into, that is behind something that's resolved through some survey output or something down the track. So I think it actually opens up a, a, a kind of a, a formative dimension of how decision-making occurs and what's important in that. And again, economists, you might say, oh, we don't really, you know, that's, that's an interesting kind of maybe edge science, but like if we're really about the science of decision-making largely, then, you know, these are the sorts of things we should start getting our teeth into who's making the decision, what kind of, you know, what kind of information is that based on? And in this workshop, we've had cool papers, which are starting to, um, you know, look at the question of what were people watching? What were, how was the, you know, relationship between, you know, this type of media and that type of media? I think we've had a period of time where, where we've tried to make a claim about some concentration of uh, political power in, you know, a platform, a, a publishing or a news platform. We've had to like basically look at where they're co-located or their buildings are or what you know number of newspapers or channels they have. Now we can actually see what the editors are saying in their op-ed pieces or how common and similar the messages are between here or there or the crowding out of the local message. Like these are much more powerful hits on those sort of questions about the kind of political economy going in there. So rather than working with sort of, you know, somewhat remote but important proxies of this sort of concentration or this sort of you know polarization whatever it might be or ownership and how that kind of works out now we can actually get to the material that is the words which are you know we can actually start and and that's that's the challenge we need to have good measures of what we mean by these things now that we've got access to this overwhelming amount of content but i think if we can nail those things then it opens up much more powerful and precise ways of arguing these points and testing these theories uh, that we couldn't have done before. Thank you, Simon. We have another question from Paul Rashke, which I think could be good for Ariana to answer. Paul, do you want to ask that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, following up on Kai's uh, comment, my experience with the satellite data is, as I said, as Stephen said, basically what Texas data allowed us is to have proxies for, let's say, human behavior or sentiment in areas that, you know, were unknown before and allows us to test new things. But uh, I received this statement years ago from a referee that basically stated proxy means measurement error. And um, I recently I met Daniel Millimet who thinks very hard about measurement error. And often in economics, you know, depending on where it occurs, we, we have our ways of arguing away measurement error, but in practice, um, especially, like, especially when it comes to satellite data, often when you send it to referees, people are become increasingly critical about what we measure. And I could see that in some applications of text as data, we might, as a community, face the same resistance sooner or later, that people question really hard, you know, what you're actually measuring and have you considered or thought deeply about measurement error and then papers might get rejected easily, either because people don't fully understand the method or maybe they don't like it. And so um, having, and that's kind of often a, a public good problem, having people working on thinking deeply about measurement error associated with text as data and maybe trying to quantify particular types of measurement error that are, well, particular to social science and economics would be, something very useful. I think my um, analogy is when you think about lab experiments, at some point, like first they were very cool. And then at some point people made the argument, how much can we generalize um, results from the lab that are done by students? And then there was this one paper that a lot of people referred to that, you know, tested the results with students versus other people and they found that the behavior in the dictator game is very similar. And then, you know, hundreds or thousands of lab experiment papers point to that one paper that wasn't necessarily published highly, but dealt with the generalizability criticism. And maybe there's something like that around um, uh, 
something we as a community community could think about uh, trying to address early on. Thank you, Paul. Ariana, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, no, um, I absolutely agree. Uh, and I really see kind of the two elements of uh, that you were mentioning. So I think we have kind of two problems here. One is the conceptual problem. Is it what you're actually measuring with the, with this data? And if you think about the example of the income data that we saw before, there's then these other, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to use exactly to, to kind of match with the with GDP data. What, what does it mean and how is it different and what, what are you differently measuring with, with one versus the other? So conceptually, I think it's very uh, important to do that step and really be clear in what is like the, the, the conceptual idea that you're trying to match and, um, and really seeing kind of where the limitations of that are, uh, maybe in a specific approach, uh, but that's kind of conceptually very important. But then at the same time, there's the measurement uh, error issue, which, which I, I absolutely agree with. Uh, it would be really helpful to uh, have more work done on that and trying to really quantify it because already uh, kind of getting a sense of um, what, what's the magnitude of the measurement error, like to what extent do we really need to worry about uh, measurement error being different and how is it different than the classical measurement error that we can uh, easily deal with. Uh, that would be, uh, that, that I think would be super important to really, especially bridge, bridge this gap between measurement and uh, inference and that we were discussing before, for sure. Thank you, Ariana. So now I want to ask Peter to, to ask his couple of questions. And I think Stephen might take those. And then also Stephen, maybe you could take those questions as a jumping off point to reflect on any other issues that we haven't covered enough in this discussion so far. Thanks, Elliot. My questions are pretty brief. First of all, would pre-registration help in addressing some of the issues that have been discussed, particularly about, you know, very large sort of um, set of choices that get made? And, and, you know, to what extent can they be put in paper ex ante in this space, if at all? Um, and the second question is just a, a, a sort of a reflection on the fact that unlike the sort of bread and butter econometrics of the last 40, 50 years, we all rely heavily on private sector technological advancement. And there's this kind of arms race amongst Google, Microsoft, and, you know, some other players to get the best tool. And these tools are coming out, you know, weekly, monthly, yearly, GPT-10 might be around the corner. Uh, and I just wonder whether it's kind of beholden upon us to coordinate or, um, you know, sort of disengage a little bit from that arms race and whether that arms race is doing damage to the academic setting for some of these um, problems. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure where the validate. So let, let's let, let's come to this pre pre registration. So I, I uh, maybe Simon knows more about this than I do because I, I I have no formal training in computer science. But whenever I read a computer science paper, um, someone proposes a methodology, and there's a table in the back. Uh, where, you know, another 10 methodologies are compared to that methodology at some standardized task, like, am I identifying analogies or, uh, sorry, like, you know, completing sentences or whatever. And there is a data set that the community has said they are going to coordinate on for doing these exercises. So that, in a way, is like a form of pre-registration because we've, quote, unquote, like, pre-registered the tasks that I'm going to compare. Now, human choices presumably were made at that stage. Like computer scientists just didn't just like invent the analogies that they want to complete, right? Like as a community, they came together and they made decisions. So I think it would be useful to separate out papers that construct these tasks from papers that, you know, answer economic questions. Like every time I want to build a proxy of distance between firms using their 10K filings, I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel, right? Because that's like two papers. One is to come up with a validation task, and the second is to answer an economic question about how distance affects mergers and acquisitions or whatever. So who is going to and who is going to publish um, and who is going to propagate the validation task that we as a community kind of, in my mind, desperately need to make some of these modeling choices? I mean, I would love to do that. So if somebody wants to get in touch to create, you know, a set of tasks that we as a community could coordinate on, um, you know, there's there's money to do that, but the problem is the conceptual, right? How do how do we start that? And I don't know if Simon or others 
have any insight into how the computer science community constructed those data sets and constructed those tasks. But I think I think that would be great if our community could could achieve something like that. Um, in terms of the arm race, I, I don't know. I think our priorities are sufficiently different, but I'm not too worried that GPT-3 is suddenly going to make these efforts that I'm describing irrelevant, right? I mean, the, the basic like the basic validation task remains. I, I, I can't just take off the shelf computer science performance metrics and expect them to matter for economics, right? Like how, how would they evaluate document similarity? The only validation tasks I've seen is like search engine retrieval relevance. So there's some data sets on, you know, does my document similarity measure correspond to what people click on when they're trying to find relevant stuff? That's not gonna map into the stuff we care about that closely, right? So. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that computational limitations are the big thing holding our field back. I think it's these conceptual issues about how, how what do we want text algorithms to achieve and how are we going to measure it in a way that is not application specific. That for me is the number one challenge and it very much relates to this pre-registration idea in a, in, you know, in a slightly different way. Simon, do you want to comment on either of those points that Stephen just made? Yeah, I mean, Preaching to the choir, or as uh, we were told by a recent Ukrainian minister, selling tomatoes to the gardener here. Um, that's yeah. That's so. The I, so where where did the you know core ML um, you know I, the uh, the data sets that are used that uh, they're actually not static. So they're um, as a you know there are as new problems are basically um, created new tasks. Uh, Effectively, what happens is the leading lab sets up a data set, and then usually one gets joined to it, and then that becomes the two or maybe three data sets for that task, and then it becomes an arms race. People trying to, and you know, there's tables you can go and uh, have a look, and everyone's basically gets their models rated on these extremely standardized tasks. Now, what's good about that is that, um, and what computer science I think uh, is is great at doing is it's, it's, it's formalism uh, is good in the sense that it says this, you, you, ca you cannot start unless you've got a really clean problem definition. And this is the clean, everyone knows what success looks like. Everyone knows what failure looks like. And so my data set, you know, is like squeaky clean, uh, full of, you know, yeses and nos or whatever it might be. And that is, you now need to go and find a way to get, you know, replicate without your model. Now, that's the, the question then is, can you map that to economics? Do we have the kind of clean hygiene uh, data set that says we all, we all agree that this is a yes and this is a no and this is a now, that's where we're going to face some troubles. So I think it's a great challenge that Stephen puts out. And, you know, I, I would love to see us build pre-registered data sets that we test for different tasks. We're going to have some challenges deciding on what goes into those data sets and even what the task might be. I mean, there's a vibrant conversation going about even concepts in economics. So we need to get our stuff together if we're going to kind of claim these sorts of things. And it may mean that we have to retreat a little to things that we're pretty concrete and sure about. We're happy with this and we're going to start from that and see if we can do it on those things. I think that's possible. Um, but yeah, it's. I think the idea is nice. I think it's worth putting effort in. And I think it is, a you know, the Paul's point is going to be a public service because it's going to build the maturity across all of it and the confidence. But um, it's going to be tough. Thank you, Simon. So this last discussion leads well into the last question I wanted to ask, and I wanted to give Ariana and Simon a chance to answer to it, and, and Stephen as well, if he's interested. Is what do you see as the long term? And you know, you can you can define long term as you like. You know, uh, five years, ten years, fifty years. What is the long term disciplinary relationship between text as data and economics and social science and uh, the field of NLP and, and computer science. And also, if you have thoughts on it, what, what is the relationship between text as data and social science and economics and with the digital humanities? Ariana, can you start on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. No, for sure. This is a super, super interesting question. And um, definitely, I think, kind of more and more collaboration uh, seems to be um, for sure needed, because right now it really does seem that there's like, I mean, very different incentives for sure, uh, which makes a lot of sense. And I definitely feel like Stephen was saying like many times is like, oh, I'm writing, like I'm basically doing a lot of measurement that goes maybe in like in a 
in an appendix, but really it will have to be a, a, its own paper. And when you're talking with, when you're seeing like presentation by computer scientists and people working in this type of stuff, then you're, you're really seeing like, oh, okay, you're basically doing all this work uh, that for us would be kind of not, you know, something that we have to think about, but at the same time, not really uh, something that we, we would, uh, that we, we would do. And then we have the actual uh, economic part. Uh, that's also, um, that's also important, of course, and that we, we tend to, you know, at the end, like probably play up. Uh, so for sure, it would be important to have more uh, interdisciplinary collaboration, and there could be uh, inputs on both parts. Um, for sure, I don't see like economists, um, I mean, I guess like, I um, don't expect economists to come up with like entirely new methods, of, of course, uh, but there could definitely be input of, you know, how this type of, I think there could be some, some input and interesting question posed of what, the type of task that we do, and that could inform uh, as well with the NLP. Uh, communities given, but that's kind of always like the big challenge of interdisciplinary uh, research is kind of aligning incentives uh, in a way that makes sense for all the different parties that are participating. Thank you, Ariana. Simon, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, just two things briefly. One is, um, so at Monash University, Soda Labs is like a bit of a new thing in that, you know, this fusion between computer science but comes really from the heart of empirical or applied uh, you know, economics and social science. And we have been now called into multidisciplinary activities from across the university, um, including from our Faculty of Information Technology, which is our computer science faculty. And what we've learned, and I think it's an encouragement, is that, um, and I, I don't want to not to uh, be negative about computer science, I'm very positive about computer science, but there's just certain ways that we in social sciences think about data and design and think about experiments in data and what we mean by kind of causality, for example, it's just not part of the worldview of a computer scientist. But when they do a validation or when they do a paper, it's basically effectively boils down often to a horse race of different models on a standard data set. And you see a table of results and there's an asterisk or an underline to say, this is the one that performed the best on the task and that's it. And we're, we're trying to do something completely different. And, We've actually had a movement from within Monash, which was like uh, they have this line about uh, uh, data science for social good coming from them. And we thought that's quite interesting. And then we realized actually when we talked to them, and now I think they've come to the view that they don't really know how to do social science. They have to partner to get applications going in any area where they need to design some sort of way of understanding some social phenomena. So I think there's a real opportunity to bring these skills to the problems that they're increasingly needing to show their you know applied skills with um but it it is real it, it actually really takes time which goes back to my point earlier about the best i think we do is actually start not instead of trying to bring fields together that uh you know have spent their lives in the two different parts of the planet but actually we we need fused uh education at the undergraduate uh level and so on we need to keep the drum going for combined or merged degree structures and so on so that we can actually see students who are exposed to both kind of languages. I mean, the concept of bilingual, I think, is important. The second thing I'd say is that um, in our work in the lab, and it may be true, I'm sure, for you guys as well, we have identified problems, needs that we have when we analyse texts like narrative discovery and things like that, which we just don't find examples, methods of that do the same sorts of things in the machine learning fields because, well, there's probably no standard data set. There's no, you know, there's no way that no one's published on this before. Or no one's tried this problem or this task before. And so it's actually quite cool, but it does mean that we find ourselves doing methods advance from time to time and we need help. Why? Because it's hard to actually pitch a methods advance paper into a, like an econ journal because they're like, I don't know, I don't know what you're doing in terms of evaluation. But at the same time, as I sort of said at the start, it's hard actually, unless you've got a computer scientist on board to really like understand what's gonna pass muster if you're trying to sell that over there. And so you kind of end up depending on that fusion, but hopefully our problems, which I think we need to keep pushing our problems and what we're trying to achieve from a theory or a design perspective into computer science and trying to get them to help solve these problems because they're often frankly gonna be the better people uh, rather than us you know, muscling our way through and saying, oh, we'll be fine to do it. I mean, sometimes that's going to work in some concepts, but I think there's, there's, there's a really good opportunities. But um, finding journals, editors, and people who are happy to work in this sort of uncanny hollow between the two, 
that is going to be a bit of a challenge. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of a buyer beware, but like I, I see it as a, as a needed, um, they're going to need us and we're going to need them. And I think we both need to acknowledge that and get on with it. Thank you, Simon. I wanted to give uh, Ariana and Stephen, the other panelists, the chance to add any last comments. In that case, I wanted to thank everyone. Thank the panelists for joining today. Thank you everyone for the interesting Q&A and discussion. Thank you to Sasha for co-organizing this uh, panel discussion and the broader event. Uh, thanks to all of you who are joining on Zoom and from elsewhere. And we'll see you in six months. <laughs>